tonight welcome to renovation hey raise your hand if it is your first time here tonight can I just see a couple of hands all right awesome thank you guys for being here we're pumped y'all are here would y'all just stand with us I'm gonna open us up in a word of prayer and then I'd like to just get after it bow your heads with me let's pray Lord God we thank you for this opportunity to worship you and give you the offering that you deserve tonight so Lord fix our hearts on you give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you, and Lord, just be so glorified in what we sing, and uh, the words that we say tonight, and it's in your precious son, Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's start with this song, Lion and the Lamb. Let's worship together.
You guys know Peyton, Melissa, and Neil, they go to our church, and we love them, and Peyton is like a little nerd, kind of like me, and he's built an observatory in his backyard, like the domed observatory with a giant telescope, huge, giant telescope to look up into the heavens uh, to find more Chinese air balloons, so I need the, I need the crash thing when I, yeah, man. When th- these are those are good jokes, so <laughs> you guys know it. So <laughs> Glad you guys are here. It's going to be a wonderful night. We're going to start our marriage series tonight, and uh, we're so gl- glad you guys have invested in your spirit at Renovation Church. So what I want to ask you to do is, if you are a guest of ours, there is a Connect card in the seat back in front of you, and we ask that you would take that Connect card and fill that out at the very end of our service, right in our lobby. We've got a little table that we want to give you a gift bag. It's filled with all kinds of goodies, quality choice gifts from Renovation Church. So take a moment to fill that out for us. Let us get in touch with you, share what God is doing here, as well as answer any questions you may have. So if you'll do that for us, we'd appreciate that. And we've got a couple quick announcements um, as well after the Connect card. We've got, um, can you do that for me real quick, Jen? What's after that? I'm not sure. There we go. Give. Well, I should have known that. Yeah. So why don't y'all give? All right, let's do the next one. And serve. Why don't y'all serve? What's the next one? And join a life group. See, this is not that hard. People think these announcements are hard. They're real easy. All you got to do is tell people these little quick things. It's that, it's that easy. Life groups, let me hit that for just a moment. Life groups are the hub of our discipleship process. So what, what we mean by that is the entire purpose of this church the entire focus, the central focus, is reproduction. It's to renovate a life that only Jesus Christ can do. He's the only one who can come in and take a dead person and raise them to life. He's the only person who can come in and take a broken person and turn them into beautiful. That's it. Nobody else can do it. Lots of people can try, but Jesus does it. So once that happens, once that renovation takes place, the the There's a few steps that we have to take in order to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus. And life groups is the start of it. It teaches us kind of just how to have community with people. And uh, I I said this in our sermon. Maybe you feel like, well, I don't really need community. But maybe somebody needs you. Maybe somebody needs you. So uh, I highly recommend life groups. You can do it from your phone. Uh, you can uh, do it out in the lobby as well or from your Connect card. If you want to just say, hey, give me more information about these life groups, uh, you can click the box there as well. And so we'd love to have you guys. All right, what's the next one for me after that? Miss Jen. Oh, yeah. So see, we have this little photo booth thing. Just keep going. <laughs> I'm telling you, these announcements are anointed. Yeah, you could look at Greg Wimbish. I mean, he's handsome. He looks great. So if you'd like to take a photo, here's why we ask. Um, We ask it because I would love for you to tag yourself at Renovation Church on Facebook or check in, uh, take a photo. It it really does help people know, hey, these guys are going to this church. It makes a big difference just in your friend group. And all of us need to impact our friend group. Say, "Uh uh-huh. That's a fact. So today's going to be a great day. We're grateful. Your kids are over there getting sugared up right now. We can't wait to give them back to you. That's going to be fun. And uh, so good luck, everybody. They're going to come out wild-eyed, man, just to see you and tell you how much they love you. So let's, uh, let's pray, and we'll continue with our worship, and Cassie's going to take it over from here. Father, we love you. Thank you for your spirit that's in this place. 
move in our hearts. Help us to worship in spirit and in truth and in passion because of what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you all stand, um, I heard something a couple weeks ago that I just cannot shake out of my head. And it's this phrase when it comes to worship, sing your faith strong. Has anyone ever heard that before? Sing your faith strong? Yeah, me neither. I never had either. Um, And I didn't exactly know what it meant. What does it mean to sing your faith strong until I found myself in a service, in a worship service, where I found myself singing something that I didn't necessarily believe. Um, I don't know if you've ever found yourself in that situation where maybe you're looking to God to like heal someone that you know or to rectify like a, a broken relationship, something like that, but like not believing that maybe he'll even do it. I found myself in that place I know I'm not the only doubter in this room, okay? <laughs> I know y'all, y'all get it, but um, I found myself in that place, and I chose to sing anyway, and I chose to sing, actually, it's this song, I Raise a Hallelujah. I'm choosing to sing anyway, even when I've got questions, even when I've got doubts, even in the middle of a situation where I don't really know where God is, I chose to sing anyway, and at the end of this song, I found myself, I mean, the only way I can describe it is that my faith was strengthened. It was stronger because I made this decision to do this. So I just want to say this as a blanket statement over every person in this room. I don't know where you're at. Y'all don't know where we're at. Um, But every single person in this room has an opportunity tonight not only to lift up an offering to our God that we love and we serve, but also we get an opportunity to strengthen our own faith. We get an opportunity to sing our faith stronger than it was to where when we walked in this room, maybe our faith was here. And when we leave, it's up here because God does that. He blesses our song. He blesses our offering that we give him. And so I just want to encourage you. Y'all stand with me. I just want to encourage you tonight, wherever you're at, maybe you're on the mountaintop. Maybe you're like, man, God is good all the time. Maybe you're somewhere in the middle. Maybe you're in the valley. I don't know where you are, but I want to encourage you to lift your song up, to look into the eyes and the face of your God and sing your faith stronger and give him the song he deserves tonight. If you're with me, can I get an amen? All right, let's sing this. Come on. Yeah. 
Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Let's lift this up as a church. with me one last time. Let's sing praise. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory. Majesty. Praise for
didn't tell them about this. <laughs> Lord, just put this on my heart. What I want to do in these last, let's say, two minutes is I want to turn to your neighbor. Maybe it's somebody, hopefully it's somebody you know, because <laughs> that's awkward. And if it's not, <laughs> that's awesome too. You make a new friend. I want you to turn to your neighbor. And it doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out story, but I want you to tell them one way that God has been good to you. That should be pretty easy. So I'll count you down, and then let's just turn to our neighbor and let's testify the goodness of God. Turn to your neighbor. Go. Testify to the goodness of God in your life by show of hands. Anybody? You got that right. <laughs> so here's what I want to do. I want to end with this chorus one last time. And from the bottom of our hearts, can we lift up this offering saying, Wow, God, you love me so much. You have shown up when no one else has. You've shown up when I didn't thought I didn't think you would. Let's lift this up with gratitude. Let's lift this up knowing that, hey, I have a story. I can testify to God's goodness tonight. Let's lift this up one more time. testify that you love us. You love us so much. You show up when no one else does. You would leave 99 others just to chase us down, and we thank you for that. Lord God, please speak to us tonight. Please let us leave here looking more like Jesus. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Hey, y'all can have a seat. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Have <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's great to see y'all here tonight. We are, I personally cannot wait to get this rolling with this not so newlywed game because I love to watch Tim Hale squirm. <laughs> Woo, it's going to be good. Uh, so, if you're not familiar with the game, the rules are pretty simple. I've got five questions I'm going to ask the panel. Everyone will write their answer down. Then I'll go back with each individual couple and have them reveal their answers with the goal being a match. So if both of them have the same answer, you get a point. Easy enough. 
And, oh, we've got some amazing, amazing cash and prizes for the winner. So y'all, y'all put your thinking cap on. So, yeah. <laughs> so before, before we get started, I did want to uh, have you guys introduce yourselves and let us know how long you've been married. Greg and Tammy Wimbish, and we've been married 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> Tim and Cindy Hale. Um, Thirty-one years. It seems like yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Dylan and Ashley Burden. Sixteen years. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> wow. Uh, and I went. I mean, I went to school here in Midlothian, but that looks like. What's uh, 55 plus 16? 70? Wait. What? Anyway, there is a lot of, of, of combined marital bliss up here. So with all of that longevity, this is either going to be really, really easy, or there's going to be some explaining to do on the way to Whataburger tonight. <laughs> all right, let, let's get going, guys. Um, first question. So you want to do go back to back when y'all write? Yes, back there you go. <laughs> All right, guys. I wanted to start off with what I think's pretty easy questions, a little softball to get your feet wet, kind of get in the groove of the game. So here we go. Question number one. Who said I love you first? Everybody got their answer? All right. Greg, Tammy, show us what you have. Greg, there we go. Points. Points for the Wimbushes. Go. All right, Hales, who said it first? I can't see. Tim. And you said Cindy. <laughs> Look, I mean, I know that. There's like love in y'all's marriage and stuff, but I I, I think Cindy might uh, unplug that. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, let's go no, to the you next can't, one. You can't do this again. We said we know the answer. We kind of plotted like if we don't know the answer, we're just gonna put Jesus because yeah, it's I, church. I was gonna. I mean, are y'all actually sure you're married? Yeah. Okay. All right. How about you guys? Hey. Her, her. We got a match. Yeah. All right. All right, so here we go. So now you guys kind of know what to expect. That was the easy one. All right. Question number two. Whose parents were more intimidating to meet? All right, Wimbushes, what you got? Tammy's parents. All right. See, that kind of surprises me, though. I, you know, I would, I would see Greg as being just a, a little Eddie Haskell, you know, hello. And, but the good guys. All right, Hales, what you got? There you go. Hales, y'all are, y'all are on We're the We're not going to go like Ofer. All right. Burdens, what you guys have? I can't see hers. Mine is that a match? Oh, all right. <laughs> see, he's because he's wearing that cowboy hat. He's used to losing. That's uh, the dang it! <laughs> that is not right. All right. I've so, got place prepared on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> so this question is for the ladies. Okay. So write down y'all's answers, and then guys, you need to write down what you think they're gonna say. Okay. All right. Ladies, if you compared your husband to a box of cereal, would he be Lucky Charms, Fruit Loops, Honey Bunches of Oats, or Captain Crunch? Honey Bunches of Oats, Fruit Loops, Lucky Charms, or Captain Crunch? 
<laughs> Can't cheat, Tim. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Write, write down what you think she was going to say. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? We're ready. All right, Wimbishes, what you got? Honey Bunches, Captain Crunch. <laughs> All right, what, what do you got, Hales? The Captain. Lucky, Lucky Charms? Man, it's terrible. <laughs> like I'm a All little right. Irish <laughs> leprechaun. That's the worst choice. Why would that even be a choice? I, well, she chose it. <laughs> All right, Burdens, what you got? Hey, magically. Lucky Charms, Captain Crunch. Every Man, dude that was picked a, Captain Crunch. That was a over. Every dude <laughs> thought we were the captain. Every dude. Every all the one girls of us. thought we were way less than. <laughs> all, right. all right. This one is for the guys. So guys, write down your answer. Ladies, write down what you think they're gonna say. All right. If your wife could go on a five hundred dollar spending spree. What store is she going to? Nope. You don't get that. I know where she'd want to go. She doesn't even know. <laughs> nope. No. Nope. All right, you guys ready? All right, Wimbushes, what do you have for us? Hey, look at there. Amazon. Now, I'm going to let that slide. That's really not a place. I mean, it's online, but I'll let it slide. All right. Y'all get a point. All right, Hales. I would rather go to here. What? What I can't see. I like, put home goods. Home goods. Costco. Because yeah, that's, she'll spend five hundred. True. That's very true. All right, burdens. Amazon. Victoria's Secret. <laughs> five hundred bucks. That's for you. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> Golly, I hadn't been in there in a while, but I, I'm assuming you get a lot of product for that. <laughs> All right, uh, all right, uh, quick, all right, just a quick uh, score recap here. Wimbishes are killing it with three points. Hales have one, and the Burdens have one. Hey, and the all Burdens, right. and this is not to point fingers, but you guys have been practicing, right? Yeah. yeah. We didn't, we just felt like God would lead us. Yeah. All right. Next question. You guys need to look in the mirror when you answer this. Y'all seem to have been pretty honest, but who has the worst morning breath? You guys ready? All right, women, should we say, Greg? Is that, is that a no-brainer? Right. I mean, we don't even need to see y'all's. We know it's Tim. <laughs> what do you got? Oh, you got to be honest. Yeah. All right. Just relax. <laughs> We're supposed to go in order with the Wimbish. <laughs> Yeah, they're good. Oh, we get see, we've been arguing this whole time. We don't even know. Thank you. <laughs> On the board. Burdens. <laughs> yeah. Hey. yeah, all of us thought we were Captain Crunch, but we're the worst yeah. breath Captain Crunch dudes ever. So I do have one last question for you guys. Blinding even though around. even though the Wimbishes are getting all the cash we can prizes. still win. Yeah, let's lay it all on the line right here. Yeah, man. double or nothing. Right, want to do that? All or nothing. Yeah. All right. Last question. Not counting your wedding night, 
What was the first meal you had as a married couple? I think. I pay attention. These things matter. All right, repeating the question. So you can't count your wedding, not counting your wedding night and all the Swedish meatballs and all that good stuff. Like the, your, your, yeah, what was your first meal as a married couple? Tim's going to put, like, bologna sandwich. You don't have a clue, do you? I have no clue. (laughs) No clue, but we ate at this place a lot, so I put it. Let's go, let's start at that end today. What what do you got, Burton? Dylan. Yeah, Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah. I can't believe you forget that, Dylan. It's embarrassing. What do you have, what do you have, Ailes? Taco Bell. We ate there a lot. That's all I can think about. They used to have 49 cent burritos. <laughs> That's right. That's how old I am. What'd you guess? The next one would be the morning, so I just said the hotel breakfast. The hotel breakfast? Yeah. This, yeah. 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 Pretty bright. All right, Wimbishes, what you guys have? Breakfast at Whataburger? All right. That wins. <laughs> Guys, thank, thanks for playing. That was a lot of fun. Let's let's give our our contestants a hand. And we have a lovely trophy for Mr. Gray. Oh. And we have some candy. And we have a fifty dollar gift card from Chick Fil A. Can only redeem it on Sunday. All right. Can y'all hear me? All right. Well, that went about the same way I thought it was going to go, to be honest with you. Um, you can be married a long time and not, like, know anything about your spouse. That's, that's what I always take from those things. But thank you guys for your uh, sportsmanship and allowing us just to have a little fun with that, especially our guests uh, that were on there. So tonight uh, we're starting uh, our marriage series, and it's a marriage mixtape is the title of it, and basically what we're trying to do is to take certain topics that are going to be difficult uh, that we have to put our focus in. I think that in the church, as well as in the United States of America, marriage is under a bombarding attack at all times. Um, We are bombarded by the internet, television, even at our workplaces, uh, it used to be that if you had a wedding ring on, you were off limits. That's completely out the window now. Nobody cares anymore. And so we have this minefield that we have to kind of get around. And so tonight I want us to start with the very first one, and that's resolving conflict. Um, I think that that is the foundation of every good marriage is being able to have the spiritual maturity and the emotional maturity to resolve conflict well, okay? Okay. Because most marriage fights, if we think about it, 90% of them, let's say, they're kind of ridiculous. Say, "Uh uh-huh. I mean, Cindy and I laugh about some of the things. And we are like ingrained in this argument. And then we step back and we're like, what are we even fighting about? 90% of them are crazy. 10% of them, you know, the police have to be called. I I get that. (laughs) Um, But 90% of them, you know, if Jesus were to to walk in and we're so invested and we're so angry and we're just staring at each other like, you know, how can you even be saved and everything like that? And if Jesus were to walk into our, in our house and go, guys, you know, knock it off, we would argue with him. We would say, like I would say, well, you don't even know anything about her, which is not true. And she would say something like, I can't believe you let him father children, you know, something like that. <laughs> How many of you have ever fought over something completely insignificant? Raise your hand. And I mean you fought. It was the principle, you know. It wasn't the topic. It was the principle that you were fighting over. This this square right here, this one-by-one square, I will die on it. I will die. 
Um, the biggest fight Cindy and I ever had was when we were younger, and we were, had been married just a few years, and her parents were coming to visit us at our house for the first time. Um, I had no idea how important this was, but I found out pretty quick. And I was going around doing the things that she had asked me to do. I had a list of all the things that needed to be done. Why is it that, <clears throat> that we decide to do these crazy projects the day that somebody's coming over to visit us? You know, it's like, Tim, can you go ahead and put that outdoor fireplace in on the back patio? <laughs> Maybe put the transom in over the front door. If you don't mind doing that just before my parents get here real quick, I really appreciate it. I, that's a sidebar issue. We need to figure out why we do that. But trying to be helpful, I had done quite a few of the things she'd asked me, and I also have ADD a little bit, and so I thought of another thing that needed to be done. And Because when I had pulled into the driveway, I had seen in the glass of the garage doors, they were smudgy and dusty. The, the glass, the little rectangular glass things. Being the good husband that I am, Dave, I went out with the Windex and some paper towels, and I was just, I spent an hour or so doing the, you got to do both sides. That's the first thing people see, guys. That's, are, you're with me. It's the, it's, you we talk about first impression all the time, but we have no idea. That's the first impression. People see that, and they're like, golly, the glass on their garage doors looks terrible. You know, that's, we don't want that. So I'm out there, wee, 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 and she comes out, and we go at it because I am doing right. I'm doing good. I'm going to change the world. And she thinks I should be doing other things. And then the, her parents show up, and we fight the moment her parents come up, we're still fighting. And then when they get here, it's like we pretend like we're Johnny and Baby from Dirty Dancing, you know? <laughs> the minute they get there, we just completely transform into, oh, whatever you want, sweetie. No, it's what you want, honey. We've all been there, I think. You know, the, the number one reason folks gave for divorce was um, incompatibility. And it's really not a reason, because the truth is, there are no two people compatible, completely compatible. They're just not. Um, you can learn to love whomever you choose to love. There are so many times our kids become unlovable, but guess what? We don't stop loving them. There are many times our kids become unlikable. I didn't hear many amens, but there are times our kids become unlikable. Maybe it's just our house, babe. I don't know. <laughs> but we still love them. And we still would take them to do whatever they need to get done and carry them around town and take them to dinner. And if they need to loan some money, we do that too because we love them. Nobody's going to be perfectly compatible with you because no one is like you. So, so no matter who you marry, you're going to be incompatible. The fact is, you can get along with anybody that you choose to get along with, and you can choose to love anybody that you choose to love. So we end up saying, this is how we end up. This is how marriages end. They end up saying things like this. I want what I want, and I want it now. And the other person says the exact same thing, and neither one of us are spiritually mature enough to change or to submit or to humble ourselves to each other. Neither one of us. And I know there are people in this room, and in your marriage, you're, you're struggling. And you're like, well, he will not humble himself and ask forgiveness. And he's like, well, she won't do this and ask forgiveness and humble herself and ask forgiveness. The amount of pride in our hearts is what's crippling. James says, why do you fight amongst yourself? Because of pride. We have so much pride in our lives. What I'm about to say may make some of us mad, and, but it's the truth. And it says this, your marriage will be as good as both of you decide it will be. I cannot tell you how many times, dozens of times, I've had a wife or a husband who have called me saying, can, we, can I meet with you about my marriage? And I'd say, well, is your husband or wife coming? And they'd say, no, they're not 
they have no interest in doing it. And I said, I'm sorry. You cannot do marriage counseling with one person. That's impossible. Now, you can do spiritual counseling. You can do a lot of other things to counsel somebody to help them, but not marital. You've got to have both people, and both people have got to be invested. Your marriage, if, if, you, if your marriage is struggling tonight, and I'm going to say because of the amount of people in this room, that the percentages are that there are a decent amount of people who have are at odds in their marriage. If you're struggling tonight, it's because of both of you are not willing to make the changes necessary to love each other the way that Jesus asks us to love each other. So today we're going to talk about resolving conflict, and we're going to learn how to get past the emotion and get to the resolution. If there's one thing that I see as a deficiency in not just marriage but in the human condition, it's resolving conflict. And so tonight you, you may say, Tim, I'm not married. Maybe I'm 17, 18, 22, 23, whatever it is, or I'm this age and I'm not going to get married. These principles apply to every relationship in your life. Because if you'll notice, it's not just marriages that break up, it's friendships that break up. Friendships break up all the time, and there are very similar reasons be- that friendships break up, and it's trust. They did something to you. They broke your trust. They said something behind your back, whatever. It's very similar, and we've got to be able to, to address these things. So the very first thing I want to say is this. The reason for conflict in our relationships is a lack of trust. And when I hear things like, you always do this, or you never do this, here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing a lack of trust. And when anyone is wounded by another person, trust is broken. And when these wounds are not healed and those disagreements are never fully resolved, a lack of trust is inevitable and the foundations of our relationships begin to erode. I always say in our family, I do not want to walk around eggshells in my house. I want my kids to know that they can razz me. They can tease me. They can make fun of me and not be afraid of me. Why? Why do I think that's important for my daughters who are sassy anyway? They're sassy, got a little mouth on them. Why do I give them permission to tease me? Number one, it's a way that we show affection in our family. But number two, I want them to see that I trust them. I trust them implicitly. My wife can make fun of me. I trust her implicitly. You may make fun of me. I may not like it. You know why? Because I don't trust you. There are certain people in our lives, there are buddies that you may have that you say, Cindy will read some text messages I may have with Matt Cooper where we're just ragging on one another. And she's like, what? I said, well, he, he knows I love him. I know he loves me. I mean, we say things that I, she'd leave me in a heartbeat over. <laughs> Trust has got to be the foundation. I want to talk about two verses of Scripture, Okay. And this one is going to be for the guys. If you're a guy, grunt for me. I was pretty weak. You guys are going to have to get into this. Don't be afraid. Guys are like, uh. They're afraid. They look over their wife for permission. Huh? This is going to be Proverbs chapter 27, verse 15. Proverbs 27, 15. It says this. Quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. And all of God's men said, Amen. That's so terrible. I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, let's pray. We'll get out of here. Um, a quarrelsome wife, I-, I call it the Chinese water torture. That's what the continual dripping is. That's, that's what they refer to as Chinese water torture, where they-, they lay a guy down and just a drop of water comes. And it starts as like nothing. He's like, dude, I can do this all day. Three or four hours into it, it feels like boulders are laying on his forehead. He's like, I'm about to quit. I'm about to say uncle right now. That's what <laughs> this continual dripping, it starts as very small, and then that's all you hear, and it's like this dr- boom. Boom, and it's like you can't go to sleep because of it, and it's just everything in your life. Ladies, so that you don't feel left out, I'm, I'm going to read a passage for you. Say, uh-huh. 
It says, it is better to have severe hemorrhoids than to live with a husband who's a jerk. (laughs) Some of you girls are feverishly flipping through your Bibles. There is no 2 Cynthia 3.16, although that has happened when Cindy has said those words. The reality is, here's a fact. Cindy and I have been married 31 years. It'll be 32 years in December, and we have fought. She is a strong lady. She is not the submissive, just easygoing wife. She is a strong leader. I love that about her. I don't I married her because of that, okay? You can't marry something because you're attracted to it, and then when you get down the road and you find out, dang, they're, they're pretty strong. Well, you knew they were strong. That's what, one of the things that attracted you to them. But the same things that attract us to each other can repel us from each other, okay? And we have to remember why we do this. I honor that in her. There are times we have to come together and go, okay, we got to get on the same page because she's wanting to charge hell with a squirt gun this way. I'm wanting to charge hell with a squirt gun this way. And we, we can do so much more together than we ever can apart. The reality is everybody fights. Conflict is inevitable because we are sinners and our sinfulness leads us to do sinful things and we're prideful. Here's what we need to understand. Listen closely. Healthy couples... Fight for understanding and resolution. Unhealthy couples fight for victory or they fight to win. They want to rub their spouse's face in it. Just like you would do with a dog who had had an accident in the house and you rub their nose in it so that that dog thinks, I can never do that again. And we end up treating our spouse like a dog. Husbands and wives do this. And we don't forgive them until we decide they've suffered enough. I'm talking Christians do this. One tool to remember is this. This is what you've got to take in your mind. There's a few things I really want you to remember tonight. This is one of them. This has got to be in your mind. It says this. You matter more to me than any argument we might have. Cindy is more valuable to me than anything we may fight over. Anything. Does your partner feel that way? Does your, does your spouse feel that way during any conflict? If not, they need to. If, you're, if your partner feels like they're run over, they don't feel that way. If your partner feels like that you abandoned them, there's, there's some who just run over people during a conflict. There's some who run away during a conflict. And so they feel abandoned. They feel like, are we ever going to resolve this? And the answer to that is no, not generally. We're never going to resolve it. I'll just, we'll just sleep on it, forget about it, and go on like nothing ever happened. And the resentment and the lack of trust just continues to build and build and build until pretty soon there's a crack in the dam and it just the water breaks through. And at that point, it's very hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. First off, listen closely. When you see your spouse is angry and fired up, the first thing I want you to do is to immediately interrupt them. Correct any factual or grammatical errors. (laughs) Some of y'all thought this was real. You suckers. Help them understand they just don't know what they're talking about. And for the cherry on top, what I want you to do is I I want you to tell them that they're crazy to feel how they feel. That's, that's the, the, the beauty. They have no reason to feel the way that they feel. You don't, why, how can you feel this way? It's crazy that you would do that. And everyone in the room is saying, Tim, you've lost your mind. And yes, we all laugh about it. And everybody knows everything that I just said is completely wrong and unbiblical. But that's how we live. And not one of those tactics mentioned accomplishes the goal of resolving anything. All it does is break trust and it continues the the breach of the foundation of your marriage. So here's what I want you to do. Number one, listen. Turn to James chapter 1, verse 19 through 20. It's this, says, 
Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Everyone should be quick to what? Yeah. We should be quick to listen. I can tell you this. The only way to listen is to stop. You have to stop what you're doing immediately. We're in a fight. Things are escalating. You've got to stop. You've got to stop your emotional ascension. It's just going through the ceiling. You can feel it coming. You're getting angry. You feel like they are taking advantage of you and you're not going to stand for it. Do they know who you are? Listening requires stopping. You cannot be on full gas and hear anything any, any other person is, is saying. It's impossible because you're too busy formulating your next thoughts. As soon as they get done talking, you cannot wait. If they would just shut up for a minute, you would let them know. And that is not listening. James, the brother of Jesus, is saying, be quick to listen. What else? The next thing was slow to what? No. I'll tell you what we're quick to do is this exact opposite. We're quick to speak and slow to listen. We've got it exactly backwards. We're quick to argue back. We're quick to make a point. We're quick to throw in a low blow. We're quick to speak, and we need to be, instead be quick to listen. And it's funny. We listen at the weirdest times. I, this has been a few years back. Cindy and I are watching TV, and she's like, do you hear that noise? I'm like, no, I mean, I'm just watching TV. She's like, you, you don't hear that. It sounds, is that you? Are you breathing? Yeah, I'm, br- oh. I'm breathing. I'll try to cut it in half. I'll, you know. It's like, it sounds like the furnace was going out or something. It's like Darth Vader's over there. So when I walk past her now, I just kind of, I don't breathe as much. and We get along great. The key is, is to listen when we don't want to. And here's where the spiritual maturity and the emotional maturity comes into play. Because it's easy to read this verse and go, yep, I'm going to do that. It's hard to do it when your emotions are really high. And this is what James, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is telling us to do. We need to run to listen, not run to defend ourselves. Spiritually mature believers will listen when it's difficult. They'll humble themselves. As Philippians says, they will esteem each other better than themselves. So they can focus on the person that they've made a covenant with. In order to listen, you've got to stop. We should be quick to listen. And again, don't let the power of simplicity pass you by. When we start to fight, we've got to stop. And we really need to focus and really hear what the other person is saying. It's so critical. That's why in the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 2, it says this. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. You ever been around somebody like that? It's like, oh, it's just talking about me the whole time or um, the husband or wife. Or they, they're not interested in hearing anything you got to say. They cannot wait to tell you what they got to say. And this, this is what the Bible says, a fool. Say that with me, a fool. Amen. Strong. A fool is like, I don't really care what you're saying. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. And that's how we often do in fights. We're not trying to understand the other person. We just want to be heard. We just want to make our point. We just want to win. And Scripture says we are acting the fool. We're acting exactly like what I just read in that paragraph that time where everybody chuckled. So I'm going to give you a tool. I've, I learned this in counseling couples. This is a remote control, okay? We don't use this as much in our marriage because it's perfect. Our marriage now is perfect. But if you are struggling with resolving conflict, I recommend this. Babe, would you come up and help me? <clears throat> Little Miss Vanna White coming up. So here's what you do. This is good. Husbands, I recommend, this is how I would do it. I hand the remote to her. When she has the remote, she's going to tell me what she feels like the problem is. Okay? I'm going to let her speak. I cannot speak because I don't have 
the Lord of the Flies conch shell. I ain't got that. She's got it. That's from grammar school stuff. I will not speak until she has that. She will speak, and then when she's done, she'll hand me the remote. And then my job is I will repeat what I think she was trying to say. And at the end, I will say, is this what you're saying to me? I'll hand her back the remote because she can't talk because I got it. Now I'm going to hand it back. That's right. This is the truth with the remote. Here we go. The real remote. Yeah. <laughs> I hand it back to her, and I've repeated back what she said, and she'll say, yes, that's what I'm saying, or she'll say, not even close. And both of those things have happened. Both of those things have happened. And then she'll, re- if I'm not close, she'll repeat what she's trying to say, maybe in a different way so that I can understand exactly. Because I really, truly want to understand what she's saying. And sometimes we talk, but it's like different languages sometimes, okay? She'll repeat it again. She'll hand me the remote. I will then say, this is what I think you're saying. At that point, generally, we've got it. And she'll go, yes, you're right. Now it's my turn. Okay? Do you see how this can be helpful? Because I have not said anything. I am waiting on her, and then I have to repeat back what she has said so that there's no misunderstanding. And now once I understand exactly where she's coming from, a lot of times that helps kind of resolve it. Because I was like, well, I didn't, I didn't know you were thinking that. But if there's still a conflict and I'm like, no, now I need to share what I'm thinking, then I will tell her what I'm thinking. I will say, this is what I feel is happening right now in this marriage. And I'll hand her the remote. She will then say, this is what I think you're saying. I will then take it and I'll go, not even close. And she'll say, well, and then I will repeat, but maybe in a different way. It is so powerful to have this physical tool in your hand because there's now a, it's like a game with a plan and rules. And we follow these rules. When there's no rules, it's every man for himself. Thank you, Bubba. And so this is a great tool. Give her a hand. She's wonderful. (laughs) Best thing that ever happened. This is a very powerful tool, and everybody has one in their house. It's not like I'm asking you to go out and buy something. Grab the remote. Husbands, I always allow my wife to start that. I just think it's smart. I think being deferential in something like that automatically can bring down the heat. But I'll tell you this, I ain't letting it go until I, until I am heard. And you shouldn't either. I'm not sitting here saying, get ready, just do patty cake all the time. We'll all live happily ever after. That ain't true. You need to have hard discussions. And what I'm telling you is you can have a hard discussion in a, a box with rules to where things don't get out of hand because the other person cannot talk without the remote, okay? That is one tool that I want you to take uh, tonight with you. Stopping to listen says this, says, I value what you're saying and I want to hear you and not just you hear me. There's a lot of power in that. There's a lot of power. And in our relationships, there's generally two two types of people. There's the person who really wants to talk, and there's a person who really doesn't want to talk. What this does is it forces the person who doesn't want to talk to talk about their feelings. It's so critical you do that. You don't just hide them, hide them, or storm, storm, storm. I'm telling you, it is just, it's destructive to do that. And you can share your feelings in a, this is a safe environment to where your spouse cannot make fun of you. They can't talk until you're done. I, I promise you, this will help you if you'll use this. Secondly, so number one is listen. Stop and listen. Number two is reconcile. This is the second thing I want you to remember in your, in your house. And you write this down. You put it in your Bible. Never forget this. I'm not going to take credit for this. I wish I made this up, but I don't remember who made this up, but I want everybody on the internet to know this is not a quote from me. It's a quote from someone. I don't know who. Don't sue me. The one who seeks reconciliation is the spiritual leader of the home. 
Men, if your wife consistently have to, has to come to you and say, hey, can we talk about this? She's the spiritual leader of your home. That ought to make you uncomfortable. Tim, can we sit down and just work this out? She's the spiritual leader of your home. And there have been many times Cindy has come to me and said, hey, I'm just miserable about this. Can we talk about this? And I get sick to my stomach because I realize she is leading me spiritually. And men, there ought to be a certain amount of pride in your, in your heart for Jesus as who God is, the man that God has called you to be to reconcile with your wife. Amen? That's true. If your wife consistently has to come to you, husband, and say, hey, I'm sorry, can we fix this? That's a problem. That's a problem. And if you don't care enough to fix this with her, it's a problem too. And this can be used for your friendships. If you've got somebody that you love as a friend and you guys have been friends, I'm telling you, I've seen... People won't come to a church because they had a, somebody who was, used to be their friend that's not their friend anymore. I can't go there anymore. I'm dead serious. Unresolved anger and resentment is the cancer of marriage. It is the cancer. And it eats away, and many times you don't even know it's there. It's eating away. It's destroying. It's destroying. It's destroying. And then pretty soon you hear you've got six weeks to live. And everybody's shocked, but it was there the entire time. Here's what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So, it doesn't say that you can't be angry. It says, in your anger, don't sin. Because anger can be a healthy emotion. Say, "Uh uh-huh. I'm telling you. Anger can be a healthy emotion. Anger drives me many times. I, do, I used to do a lot more, but endurance sports, like riding bicycles for long distances. And the big thing in my mind, and this is what I teach my daughters, every time we do something, I always say this little line. I want it on my tombstone. Don't forget this, babe. They said we couldn't do it. They said we couldn't do it. It's like this little chip on my shoulder. And there's, there's something positive about that. Anger can be a healthy emotion. Anger can also be one of the most destructive emotions in your life and destroy things. It can be so destructive. God wants us to be angry about certain things. you know that? What do you think God wants us to be angry about? What kinds of sin? All of them. Yeah, that's a hard task. But God wants, I've said this from my very first week here, God wants us to be angry, especially about protecting children. I I saw on the internet, um, I was, I'm talking with a group of Christians on a a chat little deal on Facebook. Well, not really a chat thing, but you know, one of those threads. And it was about when Target was allowing men to go into the women's bathrooms. And I said, it's a disgrace. It is a disgrace, I said, to allow grown men into a woman, number one, any woman's bathroom, but little girls go in there too. And if no one can stand up and say, get angry about that in righteous anger, man, the church is doomed. It's doomed. And I had Christians coming to me saying on this Facebook, Tim, just where do you draw the line? How do you draw the line between loving and, and saying no? And I, this is where I simply draw the line. You guys can take this to the bank. When it involves children, I draw the line. Period. If you're wanting to hurt my children or harm any, any of y'all's children, I will fight with you. Anger is okay. 
It is a powerful motivational tool to get us past things and to win things that we need to win uh, for, for the sake of the gospel and the sake of moving the ball forward for the kingdom. But in marriage, it can also be destructive. You need to, there are times, ladies and gentlemen, some of you need to get angry and fight for your marriage. That's true. Some of you need to say, no, I'm not going to let her do this anymore with my husband. I'm not going to let him do this anymore with my wife. And you need to stand up and say enough. That is good anger. Here's what Paul is saying in Ephesians. Be angry, but don't sin. Here's what I think what he's talking about in the context of marriage. Anytime you go to bed with unresolved issue and anger and you go to sleep in anger, what you did is you gave the devil a foothold in your marriage. Verse 27 is, and give no opportunity to the devil. When you go to bed with your wife at the end of the day, it needs to be resolved. Um, it's dramatic. And anytime you didn't work it out, you didn't forgive, you didn't talk about it, you go to bed and guess what happens that next day? You wake up and, and the problem is not gone. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's a little bit bigger. And I'm telling you, I know there are a lot of you right now going, this is crazy. You don't know my husband. He's got the spiritual gift of being a moron. I get that. <laughs> and I'm telling you, what you have today started one day, and sometime years ago when there was an issue, you didn't work out, you didn't work through it, and over years it compounded and it became more complex. And what you did is you cracked open the door to Satan by not working something out. And Cindy and I have agreed that we will not go to bed angry. We do our very dead level best not to do this. And in 31 years, I can count on maybe two fingers that that's happened. And we will work it out. Now, there have been times that we haven't slept for five days. <laughs> and I don't recommend that either. <laughs> but we've got to work on these hard things. We can't run from these hard things. We have to work on these hard things because, like we said in the very beginning, your spouse matters more than any argument or any disagreement. They've got to matter more. No unresolved issues. Number three, the last thing. We're almost done. When you've resolved something and the remote control has been put back in its spot and the, the anger has subsided, this is the really big one and this is the one that all of us are going to struggle with. Pray together. It's a tough one. If we're continuing to seek God and we know in our fight, if Cindy and I are arguing and we know in the back of our mind, golly, we're going to have to pray here in a little bit. It changes the dynamic. If we know, if there's this rule, if there's a rule that we're going to follow together, it does change the dynamic. Some of the things that are said maybe aren't quite as acerbic. When we know that, we know we're about to bow our heads and talk to Jesus. I mean, he's here the entire time. He knows what's going on. And there is an intimacy that happens in prayer in marriage that is as powerful as sex. Maybe more so. Resolving conflict is always easier when God remains at the center of our marriage. Resolving conflict is always easier when God remains at the center of the marriage. And here's what I want to leave you with tonight. How many of you have heard the phrase Jesus uses to love your enemies? Everybody have heard that phrase? I certainly have. Let me ask you a question. How can you love your enemy and hate your spouse? How's that possible? How can you be right with Jesus and hate your spouse? All of us want to look good on Facebook and Instagram and go on these mission trips and do all these things where we take selfies with people we don't even know. And we treat the ones who live in our house horribly. The answer is we have zero chance of loving our enemy if we're not able to reconcile with our own spouse. Zero chance. The concept of blessing those who use us, as Jesus said, who, who spitefully use us is unimaginable to someone who's not abiding in Jesus 
as Jesus is the vine of their life. If you're not walking in the Spirit, you will have zero chance of loving your enemy, your spouse, or your friend because they're all going to do things that will make you go crazy because we're people, all of us. And tonight I want you to remember this. When you're in a disagreement, stop. Cool down a little bit and just listen. Get your remote control out. Hand it to your spouse. Let them talk. Hear them. Get your chance to talk. Tell them what you also think. Come to an agreement on what both of you are trying to say and then pray together. I promise you, it will revolutionize your marriage. If at the end of a bitter, difficult conversation, you can look at each other in the eyes and there are people I love here. And you can tell them that I love you more than this argument. And we're going to love Jesus together, hand in hand. And I want you to be the first one to run to reconcile as quickly as you can because that's what spiritual leaders do. Pray with me. God, tonight we just ask that you would um, move in our hearts and that you would move in the marriages that are here, represented, God, in this place. I am just honored to be able to share some principles from your word that I pray are going to impact the men and women in this room, God, because um, we need help. Uh, there are so many times where our, even our own society pushes us to divorce, and it breaks your heart, and it breaks up families, and it's destroying us, God. I pray that we would fight for each other we would fight to remain not only in love with each other, but in love with you, God. I pray, Father, that you would um, forgive us for our pride because it's our pride that causes us to fight, that causes us to want our own way. And I pray that we would humble ourselves before each other and before you, God, and that we would love each other. Husbands, that we would love our wives the way that you love the church. And, and God, these wives that we would... Respect our husbands, God, as well. We love you in Jesus' name. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a chance to pray with your spouse. If you have your spouse with you tonight, I just we're going to, Kirk's going to play a little bit. And then after that, we're going to take our offering up. If you'd like to help us with our offering, we'd love you. loud just with your spouse just for a couple minutes please do that When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come 
longing just to breathe something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart And I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you Just sing that chorus again I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus It was so good to have you tonight. Out in the lobby, we've got some of these cards that you can invite your friends to our church. We've got a great church. I'm I'm so blessed. God put us here, and I've got one quick announcement that we're going to talk about real quick, and then we're, everybody's going. And I know we went a little long today because Cooper took a long time with the newlywed game. So we are we're pretty full. We've had really we've added chairs every night, and we're going all the way to the wall on these sides and. Um, God has blessed our church, and we've had an opportunity uh, to relocate to a different facility. And so we have accepted that um, opportunity. And so that's exciting for us. And if if you know where Mountain Peak Elementary is, you guys know where that is? Raise your hand. Everybody knows where Mountain Peak is. Right off 663, go straight to 663, almost 875. And on the left, there's a church that used to be called Liberty Baptist Church. It's been rebranded now. It's called The Peak. Okay? And we are going to be allowed to meet there. They've been gracious enough to allow us to meet there at Saturdays at 5. Nothing changes time-wise for us. But uh, we're excited uh, to partner with them and for their graciousness to uh, allow us to meet there. So that that's going to happen in March, March the 4th. So we're going to hang out here through February, and then March the 4th will be our first Saturday at the Peak Church on 663. You with me? Say, uh-huh. That's big, yeah. We're excited. And y'all can stand. These guys are from the Peak Church. Y'all stand and let, y'all give them a hand for letting us be like little hobos. We love y'all. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Pick up some of these invite cards, and we'll see you Saturday. All right? God bless you.